All right, this is lecture seven on chapter seven out of the book. All right, we're gonna talk about um, what a magnetic field is. Uh, most of you guys probably kind of heard about it or know about it. Uh, electromagnetism, uh, magnetic hysterias, all right? And then we're gonna end up with uh, DC motors uh, and generators uh, towards the end. So we define you know, magnetic quantities as what we call uh, magnetic fields. And what we do is we can, we take into consideration what we call flux lines, all right? So if you can see uh, the lines here that are going out of north and into south with the little arrows, those are flux lines. That's representing the magnetic field. But we do that and calculate it in terms of magnetic flux. Think of like how strong a magnetic field strength is. All right, so where the lines are close together, all right, our magnetic field is much stronger. Okay, so it's much more dense and we're much stronger. As they go outward, right, and loop around from north to south, they do become weaker. But that's why magnets are much stronger when you bring them close together than when they're far apart, all right? The strength of the magnetic field of the flux as you bring them together. All right, so where they're closer together, we got a stronger magnetic field. Where they're farther apart, all right, our magnetic field is not as strong. So flux lines, for us, and this is why you know magnets come into play and in, in when we talk about the Earth and the magnetic north pole, all right? Flux lines always, always, always go from north to south. So I want you to start thinking about why, why um, opposites attract and why likes repel when we do magnetic fields, all right? North doesn't want to go to north. North wants to go to south, all right? So that we have a nice field uh, that goes around whatever object or whatever magnet we're, we're talking about here or whether it's around the earth All right, and now I don't have a lot of this in class All right, but if we were to take some shavings We do have a big pile in the back by the plasma cutter. We can maybe get out uh, and take a look and see what happens uh, When we got some magnets, All right, but this is what we're gonna look at So if you kind of look at how the mag the, the iron shavings are sitting there on top of the magnets You can kind of see all the different flux lines look very where it's very dense or north and south are together, uh, and then as it goes away from the magnets, okay, it's not quite as strong. You can see how the fields can okay, kind of bow and arc around each other. I mean, this works for any type of magnet. So think about, uh, you know, in the movies you see like an, an EM pulse, and like an electromagnetic pulse. That's what it's really doing. You're pulsing out that magnetic field, all right, which jams all the electronics and shuts them down because you know, you're interfering with current. All right, so if we talk about like the Earth, right, and why our magnets always point to due north, all right, or our compass, it's very, very important. All right, so you can get your bearings straight. But in a sense, you know, the Earth's magnetic pole is kind of moving, so we can see where the flux lines are and how they occur on Earth and flow from north to south. But this is really what's kind of going on here. There's really two different uh, north poles, all right. There's the geographic North Pole, which we have determined, um, you know, that we use for maps and things like that. And then there's magnetic North, all right? So you can actually see what the difference is between magnetic North versus geographic North. Geographic North moves, all right, because our Earth is eventually rotating and kind of tilting. The magnetic North tends to stay the same all the time. That's why uh, compasses and things like that for us always work. So, when we start talking about flux lines, all right, we can create flux uh, through uh, and create current through a wire, all right? So magnetic flux lines surround a current carrying wire. So when there is current going through a wire, all right, we just take a wire, we hook it up to a power supply, there's a magnetic field that goes around that wire. Uh, those of you guys that go into the engineering and construction side, of, of electrical engineering or something along those lines, there's a reason or when you look up in a factory and you see different kinds of cables in trays. There's control cables that don't have a very high amount of current in them. You know, we're talking milliamps of current, you know, for, contr for controls. So like on our 870 trainer, we're really only wanting to turn stuff on and off with the voltage. We're not driving heavy duty motors or anything like that. So we have control cables that go back to the PLC. Okay, low voltage, low current. Those don't create large magnetic fields. 
However, when we're running a 480 volt three phase motor, right, because the wire size is much larger, we're creating a larger magnetic field. So your control cables and your power cables run in different cable trays. Okay, and you can only fill them so much because you'll create too large of a magnetic field. And that magnetic field that you create can actually interfere with the other cables in the tray. So it's very, very important that we understand that. And this is how we develop one of the switches that we're going to talk about a little bit later on when we talk about a solenoid. Uh, we can detect magnetic fields or we can make a coil of wire that produces a large enough magnetic field all right, to open and close a plunger. So it's, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, in some of my classes, we're going to be building Tesla coils uh, where we use a couple different uh, magnetic fields and we transform the voltage up and we can transmit voltage instead of current. So it'll be very cool. So what's really happening, and we're not going to do this experiment in class, all right, but it, if you were to uh, put some uh, iron filings on a piece of paper, right, and we could put a, a wire through it and give it a voltage, we would see that it would form concentric circles around the wire. Remember concentric circles, are, you know, if you throw a pebble in the water, all right, you could see a circle within a circle within a circle within a circle, and they're evenly spaced. That's really kind of what's going on uh, when we do that. All right, so the cause of the flux is called the magnetomotive force, the MMF. All right, so how do we calculate this? We have a formula. F subscript M, so that's force magnetomotive, equals the number of turns of the wire times the current. This will be important as well. Uh, someday you're going to talk about inductors. We're not going to hit it heavy in this class when we talk about inductors, uh, when we do magnetic switching and things like that. But a, a magnetic uh, inductors store a magnetic field, whereas capacitors, which we are going to talk about, store a charge. All right, so we can use inductors and capacitors to filter signals and do those sort of things. But for our case, okay, we're going to talk about the magnetomotive force, and we refer to that unit as an amp turn, all right, where N is the number of turns of a coil of wire. All right, so we're going to make a big coil of wire and produce a magnetic field. And I is the amount of current that we put through it. You know, it might be milliamps, it might be amps, uh, those sort of things. We just got to be careful with how much we do put through it, all right, uh, for our safety in class. So let's do some calculations here. We're going to calculate the magnetomotive force of a uh, coil that has 450 turns on it, and if we plug 5 amps through it. So it's just going to be 5 times 450, so the force magnetomotive is Ni, all right, 450 times 5, so we're going to get 2250 amp turns. So what I really want you to think about, right, in the movies when, we, when you see something and it's like an electromagnetic pulse or a pulse gun, all right, the magnetic pulse is very, very large. You, there's a lot of turns and coils of wire, all right, inside of that, and they boost it through the current with a lot of current, all right, that field gets larger and larger and larger. So as we increase the number of turns and we increase the current, right, those are, that's a direct relationship. So as turns goes up and current goes up, or if one or the other goes up, the magnetic force or the magnetomotive force will also increase. So there's a direct relationship. So if we want a stronger field, we have more turns. And we'll experience that when we do our Tesla coils and things like that. So you might have done an elementary school or something. You might have made an electromagnet or things like that, you know, or you've had a battery uh, that you've connected to some sort of magnet and you've wrapped a wire around it a few times, all right? The magnetomotive force, okay, it's not a true force for physics in the sense, but we, we think of it, it's, it's creating the flux field. That's really what we're doing here. And this is going to be important when we step into transformers because this is how we actually transmit uh, electricity back and forth across a transformer. They don't, the wires don't physically touch. We use a magnetic field to do that when we transform something. So. When I'm talking about transforming something, we'll get to that in a later section, but uh, at your house, right, we have different voltages. We have uh, 480 volts probably comes into your neighborhood, all right, and then it steps down maybe into, they take one phase out of that 480, that steps down to 240, all right, and they take one leg of that 240 and they split it and they go to your house as 120, so like what you plug into your outlet's 120. We have to transform all those voltages down. Well, we do it based on magnetic field and number of turns of a wire and how much current we're sending through it. So let's do an exa another example here. 
what's the magnetomotive force, so the MMF, right? Of, if a 250 turn coil has three amps through it. These are the basic problems. You guys should be doing good in this chapter. I mean, really, it's just taking 250 times three. So when we do that, we get 750 amp turns. Remember that A dash T is amp turns as we go through this problem. Just another one, just making sure that we're solidifying our magnetomotive force skills here, all right? We have 0.3 amps that we're gonna put through this, right? 300 milliamps, we have 500 turns. Literally, multiply 500 times 0.3. Making sure, hey, when you do multiply this though, um, and I give you something in milliamps or microamps, make sure you convert it to amps first, like this one's 0.3 amps. Don't use 300 milliamps unless you write it as 300 times 10 to the minus 3 when you do your calculation. All right, so these are all the influencing factors, right? The number of turns of the wire, the amount of current, the reluctance of the material, and we're going to talk about reluctance in a little bit and what that really means. Okay, different materials you know, allow us to conduct electricity better than others. All right, so we use like an iron core magnet versus like an aluminum type, you know, substance that we would wrap it around um, and, and those sort of things. So it, it just kind of depends on the material that we're going to wrap it around. Aluminum will be very bad. It heats up. All right, it might melt. So we, we got to choose, you know, the right materials when we're doing this thing. But if we calculate the magnetomotive force here, it's going to be 500 times 0.3, which ends up giving us 150 amp turns. And you can write it as AT or A dash T. That, that's really not here nor there as far as the significance piece. All right, so where does this stuff kind of come into play? All right, so we've done stuff on the 870 trainer on station one. So this part should be kind of review. So in the bottom left-hand corner, Okay, I've taken a picture of our 870 station one. You should know that that's the feed cylinder on station one. And notice how the light's on on one of the sensors, right? What's that doing? We're indicating that the, the cylinder is in the retracted position, okay? Inside the cylinder is the piston head, all right? And the hall sensor is picking up the magnetic field of the piston head. Well, this is how it's happening, okay? So the hall effect, Okay, that's the occurrence of very small voltage that's generated from opposing sides of a thin current carrying conductor or semiconductor. So that's what really what we're doing. That sensor is picking up that small magnetic field there. That's why those have to be very close, all right? They have to be in very close proximity to one another to pick up that field because it's not a very strong field, all right? We can't have strong fields because that will interfere with the other electronics or control pieces that are in the system. So that's why these sensors, notice the hall sensors, they are placed in specific points, right? And in, in a lab we've done, I've probably moved the hall sensor on you so that it can't detect it, and it really wasn't a big slide, right? I might have slid it, you know, half an inch one way or the other, and it didn't pick up the, uh, the magnetic field given off by the piston head that's in there. All right, so very, very important on location. All right, so it picks up that magnetic field. So the magnetic field between the piston and the hall sensor. So we got our north and south field. Remember magnetic fields cause electrons to flow in a wire. So what happens is when those magnetic fields are touching to each other, we're creating current flow. And that current flow is what turns our sensor on and off and communicates with our PLC. All right, so that magnetic field creates electron flow, creating current, and that current you know, that's why that light is on on the sensor. One, that's to indicate for us visually that we know the plunger's there, but it's also sending a signal to the PLC saying that the, the, the piston's there and that the uh, cylinder is in the retracted position. So it's very, very important. You know, it has two purposes. One's for us to indicate and we can visually see, the other's to communicate with the PLC because our programs that we write are based on the location of those sensors. All right, another way that sensor looks like, all right, it looks almost like a transistor right there, but it's flat, all right, and you can kind of see how we would wire it up. So we can use different Hall effect sensors, uh, you know, for different things, magnetic fields. Uh, we can use it to navigate if it's in a small room or things like that. So where else? Um, we use it, you know, in a lot of different places throughout industry. So mostly, you know, in manufacturing and things like that, it's a very simple uh device for us to use on a closed loop feed system. We're getting feedback. We need to know where something is because if it's there then we have to do another step in our process. So if we take a look where are they most commonly used? 
okay? Combustion engines, tachometers, right? Tachometers you're gonna use in the mechanical lab. That's how you're gonna measure the speed of how fast the shaft is rotating. Uh, Anti-lock braking systems, brushless DC motors, okay? We wanna detect the position of the magnets, all right? We can also use it, notice, you know, I have a couple of uh, gifs on here, so you can see as it's rotating, it's, it's going off every time one of those parts is coming around and detects the field. So with the, in your car, all right, when you know how fast you're going, your, your, uh, your miles per hour, and you look at your speedometer, all right, there's these sensors down on your wheels to help figure that out. So and then on the far right, it's real similar to what I showed you for station one, all right, we can detect when a cylinder has been extended or retracted. All right, other places were used, right? So that's the wheel sensor I was talking about in the upper left-hand corner. So it knows how fast, you know, a wheel or a gear or something is spinning. And on the right-hand side, it kind of shows how it, when it spins, all right, what we do is we have that magnetic and the sensor bounces, the magnetic field will bounce off the gear and reflect back onto the Hall effect sensor. And what it does is it, keep track, it keeps track of how many of those teeth go around in a certain amount of time. So that's how it detects it. All right, uh, even in your gear shifts, okay, before uh, there was a Hall effect sensor so that you know, you know, when you put your vehicle in park or neutral or reverse or things like that, it illuminates which one of those are based on where the sensor is on your gear shift. All right, and just a little small, you know, demonstration so that we can see where the sensors are, you know, in some sort of test and we can see what's going on when it detects. All right, this might be, you know, sliding a, a chair up and down and, uh, you know, testing things for an auto plant. Uh, you know, uh, when you see what they do with crash test dummies and how far, you know, in an accident the a chair might slide forward and you hit the steering wheel or things like that. So, just different fields that you use, okay? We've done this one in a lab before too. We got a solenoid, all right? And solenoids are very important. So in the bottom right hand corner, okay, I've taken a picture of the solenoids that show up on each station we have on the 870 trainer, right? They're the they're what's in black there and you can see the wiring that goes back to the PLC. All right, but what are we really doing? You know, based on the ladder logic that the PLC goes through, we either have current or no current through. So what happens here is inside those solenoids, there's a coil of wire, kind of like you see in the picture right there. And that coil of wire, once we put a current through it, all right, the PLC is gonna tell it to put a current through it if we need it to open or close a valve. So once we put a current through it, it creates a magnetic field and it sucks that plunger inside opening an airway in the directional control valve. The directional control valves are what we call the DCVs. All right, they're the blue or teal uh, pictured in the bottom right hand corner that's connected to the solenoid valve. All right, and then when the current is gone, all right, the PLC shuts the current off so there's no current flowing through that coil creating magnetic field. The solenoid gets to stick back out using the spring. It's a, we call it a spring return. All right, so it closes the other air valve. So there's how we use a solenoid uh, to open and close uh, pneumatic valves. A very, very simple system way of doing it, all right? We're just using um, magnetic field to open or close a plunger in that case. All right, any of you guys that have like a sprinkler system at your house, uh, same exact thing. There's a solenoid that runs to the controller for your sprinkler. So when you turn your sprinklers on, you're literally just giving a small voltage to the solenoid which opens the valve for the water to flow and turns on the sprinklers for however long you timed it. Uh, it's a very simple system. It's an automatic sprinkler system. You have a timer and you really have just something that opens and closes the control valves. So there's how you can really relate that to something that you might have at your house or what we have on the trainer uh, at school. All right, another very, very common way, all right, is a relay. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner how a relay is working. So there's the coil of wire, and when we give that coil of wire current, it creates a magnetic field, and it closes that relay. So this is a normally open relay, all right? And then when we give it a coil, uh, the coil of wire current, all right, creates that magnetic field and closes the relay down. So I have some of these we can look at in class as well. So a relay is just an electrically controlled switch. That's all it is. It's a relay switch and we're either making something have current flow or not. And the switch is based on the current we give it. So the relay is either open or closed based on the electromagnetic coil. So, 
So just relaying what you physically see on that schematic symbol, <clears throat> the bottom part of the schematic is the coil. So if we're looking at the relay on the left hand side, the one that's actually uh, giving you an animation, all right, that's the coil of wire right there. If we look at the top part of the schematic where it has the switch, okay, that's the right hand side of the relay there that's being animated. So you can see the switch opening and closing on the clickers at the top of the relay. And you know, just being able to understand the relay, we have normally open and normally closed contactors. So with a relay that's normally closed, all right, the relay is closed, then we give it a magnetic field and it opens the relay. So we use one that's always normally closed. So like something like a, we wouldn't use a relay for an e-stop, but like an e-stop is normally closed, right? And then when we hit the e-stop button, we open the circuit so current can't flow. So same kind of concept, a normally closed contactor it's normally closed and then when we use the solenoid or not the solenoid the relay it opens that contactor and then vice versa the NO the normally open contactor on a relay we do the opposite it starts normally open and then closes when we apply the uh, the current and create the magnetic field so kind of like the one that we saw in the animation piece right there all right so if we want to talk about magnetic uh, flux quantities and things like that. We determine them. There's two different quantities we kind of talk about. We talk about a Weber and we talk about a Tesla. All right, Tesla is much larger units. All right, but we use the flux lines. So how the flux lines and how we um, create a Tesla, we use the flux lines. So those are our phi. The Greek symbol for that is phi. Those are the magnetic field lines that we saw like at the beginning of the lecture that uh, with the magnetic shavings where you could see where the fields were going. So the flux lines are based on the area, all right, how large that like magnet is, let's say, uh, based in meters squared. So we have to make sure our quantities are correct here. So we're going to calculate uh, the flux density, all right. So flux density is beta equals phi divided by area. So that, that capital B is a beta, it's a Greek letter beta. We're going to take phi, which is the flux in Weber's divided by the area. So we're going to do some calculations to get this, all right? So if you need to pause the video, that's fine, but uh, we'll just keep moving here. So beta, flux density in Tesla's, is flux divided by area. All right, so how strong our flux is, you know, how many lines we have and, uh, divided by area. Okay, so we use phi. This is just to kind of recap of what I was saying verbally. And we use a unit of measure as a Weber. What, what is a Weber though? One Weber is 10 to the eighth lines of flux all right and these these are going to be numerical values we're going to use here in a minute so one weber is 10 to the 8 lines of flux and normally we talk about things in uh micro weber so it's a little easier for us to handle so micro weber what that is is a hundred lines of flux it'll make sense kind of as we do an example here in a second all right so when we do the flux density all right we this was on the last slide so this is just a recap all right, beta is phi divided by A. So let's do a couple examples here, okay? We, uh, we're gonna start with A and then we'll work on example B. Each dot up here in part A, okay, represents 100 lines of flux. So we need to know how many dots there are, first of all, so you're gonna have to figure that piece out. And then we're gonna have to calculate area in meters. Now what's the hard part about this problem is I've given you the area in centimeters. So we had to take 2.5 centimeters and convert it to meters, all right, before we find the area. And these are nice rectangles, right? So how do we find the area? Just length times width. So remember, 2.5 centimeters is 0 0.025 meters. We move the decimal place two places to the left to go from centimeters to meters when we do this calculation, all right? But we're going to find the flux density. It's just phi over area or flux divided by area. So we counted the dots here. All right, there's 49 dots, so seven by seven. There's seven rows, seven columns, 49 dots. Each dot represents 100 lines of flux. So our flux in this case is 49 micro Weber's. 49 micro Weber's. Our area, so like I said, we have to convert that 2.5 centimeters to meters. So 2.5 centimeters, move it to the left, two places, 0 0.025. So we're going to take 0 0.025 times 0 0.025. So our area in meters is 0 0.000625. Now we're in the correct units, and we can actually just substitute into the equation. All right, so beta equals phi over A. 
So we take 49 times 10 to the minus 6, because it's 49 micro Weber's, and remember micro is 10 to the minus 6, divided by the area, which is 0.000625. Okay, when we get that, our beta, our flux density is 0.784 micro Weber's per meter, or we make that into Teslas, okay, by moving the decimal place three places um, to the right there, okay? So we end up getting 78.4 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla. I do have a correction that needs to be made on this. <clears throat> it should be 0 0.0784, not 0.784. So I went ahead and made that correction. So now that you can see, uh, it should be 0 0.0784 uh, because it's 10 to the minus 3 Tesla. There. So sorry about that, but we should be fixed and good to go now. So. <clears throat> What that is, is that 78.4 times 10 to the minus 3 in our units there are Tesla. All right, let's move on to the next one now. We have beta equals flux, or phi, divided by A. Same equation here. Uh, we're going to do the exact same approach. So we need to convert the centimeters to meters, and each dot's 100 lines of flux, and we need to know how many dots there are. So if you count them up, right, just do, you know, we got six... Uh, Six rows, seven, um, or sorry, eight columns. Um, and we get, uh, hold on, not eight. It's actually 12, sorry. Trying to rush through something here. All right, so we got six by 12, which is 72 dots, okay? And remember, each dot is 100 lines of flux, so we're gonna get 72 dots, which is 72 micro Weber's, okay? So that's our flux, that's our fee. And then we have to find the area. So remember centimeters to meters, move the decimal two places to the left because uh, if, it, if it was uh, millimeters, we'd move it three, but it's centimeters, we only got to move it two. All right, so our area ends up being 0 0.025 times 0 0.05. So we end up getting 0 0.00125 meters when we do this. So now we substitute in, all right? So we're gonna have 72 times 10 to the minus six divided by 0.00125. All right, and we get that our beta is 0 0.0576. We convert it to Teslas. It's a little bit easier of a number to manage, you know. Same reason we use all of our SI prefixes and things like that. So it's 57.6 Tesla, okay, times 10 to the third. So we use that, or, or it's a micro te or a milli Tesla, okay. 5.76 times 10 to the minus third is a milli, so 57.6 milli Tesla when we apply this, okay. So that's really just telling us our, our flux density. You know, how strong is that flux? So when we look back at the beginning of the lecture, uh, where all those iron shavings were collecting around the North and the South Poles, all right, we're really looking at the, that's how strong that field is at that particular location. Okay, so let's do a couple more. Uh, notice, just to kind of throw you off, um, what's the flux density in a rectangular core that has eight millimeters by five millimeters if the flux is 20 microwebers. So in this case, I give you the flux, right? It's 20 microwebers, nothing to calculate there. But I give you the rectangular core and it's eight millimeters by five millimeters. We have to make sure that that's in meters. So millimeters to meters, we have to move the decimal place three places to the left. Formula is the same, right? Still beta equals phi over A as we go through this. All right, but when we do this, um, we uh, have to make sure that I rewrote eight millimeters as eight times 10 to the minus three, and I rewrote five millimeters as five times 10 to the minus three because we had to go to meters. So that's moving the decimal place for us. So we get 0.5 Weber's per meter squared, which is roughly 0.5 Tesla, okay, if we do it in this case. And if we want to take it and put it in a Gauss, okay, if we want to put it into a Gaussian, um, we take 0 0.5 Tesla and we multiply it by 10 to the fourth Gaussian. All right, so we get 5,000 Gauss when we do that. So we move the decimal place to the right four places. So there's how we put something in from Tesla into Gauss. Just another unit of measurement. Um, Gaussian always deals with magnetic fields. Uh, old school TVs that used to have magnets in the speakers the corners and it would impact the screen and your screen wherever the magnets were would change colors and be pink and things like that so you could take your tv in to like best buy or circuit city or those kind of places and they hit it with a gaussian field and it realigns all those 
uh, those magnetic flux lines and everything so your TV screen would look normal again. So just something along those lines, all right? How can we read it? Uh, I don't have one of these to show you, but uh, you can use a Gauss meter, all right? And it'll actually read the magnetic field. So you might see somebody like in the movies or like Ghostbusters or things like that where they got this little meter that's kind of going around. You're reading magnetic fields uh, and things like that, all right? So we have magnetic switches as well, similar to like a relay sort of system, okay? And the magnet opens and closes, all right? So instead of a relay, a relay is where we use a coil of wire, okay, coil of wire and to create the magnetic field. The switch can also just use a plain old magnet that moves close uh, to something, okay, more of a proximity type scenario. Same convention when we draw them schematically, we have a normally open, okay, and we have normally close. So what kind of switch might do this? Um, think of the security devices uh, that you might buy uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or things like that, right? The high-end stuff that they have to demagnetize, all right, when it goes across the scanner, has these kind of switches in it. Read, you can use like a read switch as well when you do this, all right? But those are going to be like your your devices, uh, They when you walk through or outside of like Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart, they get those big... A magnetic field detectors uh, that you walk through and that's kind of what sounds the alarm uh, when you're going through all right so how do we calculate you know which direction the magnetic fields going uh, that's important for us to be able to detect the magnetic field so we want to know which way the lines of flux are going so the cylinder that you see here is a wire and we're sending I right current through that wire in a particular direction so what you want to use here is what we call the left hand rule so you're going to put your point point your thumb in the direction of current flow and your fingers are going to curl in the direction of the flux line. Okay, So this is called the left hand rule. Your thumb goes in the direction of the current and as your fingers curl around the wire technically, you wouldn't like obviously do that in your life, but that tells you the direction of the field. That becomes very, very important in motors because we want to keep track of which direction the field is because that's how we make a motor rotate. All right, we're going to get to that towards the end of the chapter here. So it is important. You're like, why would we want to know which direction the field is? Well, because we use it in motors and how we change the fields in the motors to force the rotor to rotate. So very, very, very important. Thumb always in the direction of current flow. All right, fingers tell you the field or the flux. Okay, the direction. All right. Just a review so we don't forget what's the flux density. We got it 7 millimeters by 4 millimeters if the flux is 42 microwebers. Same equation, right? Wanted, you know, just make sure we got it down and just note that we got to move millimeters to meters. So move the decimal place three places to the left or use 7 times 10 to the minus third, 4 times 10 to the minus 3. So just, just another example problem I wanted to throw towards you guys to have there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about permeability. What permeability is, and we use the Greek letter mu for permeability here. It's it's the how easy of magnetic can, field can be established in a specific type of material. All right, different types of material allow us to create a magnetic field. Like you wouldn't want to create something a magnetic field using wood or plastic, right? They just don't help amplify that whatsoever. But if we have something like iron or things like that, yeah, that's definitely going to help us. Uh, we do everything um, based on you know the permeability of a in a vacuum okay so we have to know understand what the difference between mu and mu mu naught is or mu zero however you want to call it okay mu subscript zero that's the definition of the permeability in a vacuum it's four pi times ten to the minus seven webers we use that as a reference for the permeability of any material okay we always base it back to what a standard permeability is. Okay, so we call we want to find what we call the relative permeability. That's the ratio of the permeability to the permeability of it in a vacuum. So mu r, okay, mu relative or relative permeability is mu, right? The ease of which that specific material establishes a magnetic field divided by how it establishes a magnetic field in a vacuum. All right, so let's just take a look here. Mu R is mu over mu naught. The last part before we do a calculation is we're going to use reluctance. Reluctance is the opposite of permeability. Reluctance is the opposition to establishing a magnetic field in a material. Okay, it's reluctant. It doesn't want to establish a field. So 
So we got two different equations here. Here's the reluctance equation. Okay, it's L divided by mu A. Length of the path divided by permeability times area. So go ahead, pause and get those down. We're gonna apply them here in a second. All right, so what's the relative permeability of a ferromagnetic material whose absolute permeability is 480 times 10 to the minus six? If you guys like these calculations, these are the easiest ones to do, okay? Mu R, the relative permeability divided by uh, equals mu over mu I. The mu I, okay, is the, what we're gonna be using. That was the standard one. That's the four pi times 10 to the minus seven. That one's gonna be constant. So all you have to do is take the absolute permeability of the material that I give you, which is 480 times 10 to the minus six, and we divide it by four pi times 10 to the minus seven. That's a constant. We will always use four pi times 10 to the minus seven, all right, every time we do this calculation. So our relative permeability is 381. If we look at the next example, doing the same calculation, only using 560 times 10 to the minus six, we should get 445.63. I want you to make sure that you pause the video and that you're getting these numbers in calculation. I don't necessarily show how to put it in your calculator here, but if I were you so that there's no issues with your calculator, I would put the numerator in parentheses and the denominator in parentheses before I entered it in. So just double check. Anytime I got an example here, make sure that you're getting the same numbers as I am uh, so that you know that you're putting it in your calculator correctly. That's very, very, very important. Don't just kind of stare at the screen and be like, oh yeah, I totally get this. But then you don't write it down in your notes and you don't put it in your calculator and it doesn't help you, all right? You won't retain it unless you do it. It's just like getting good at video games. It's like getting good at sports. It's like doing all those thing, different things. Repetition, repetition, repetition. So that's what's good about doing this on the video, right? We can pause the video, watch it, practice it, understand it, and then make sure you know what you're doing before you move on. All right, same concept here, right? We got 720 times 10 to the minus six Weber uh, per ampere term. Look at that, that AT at the bottom, right? That's magnetomotive force, but we'll get to that in a little bit, okay? But 720 times 10 to the minus six divided by four pi times 10 to the minus seventh, same concept here, all right, 572.95. So which one's the best one? The bottom one, all right? There's a bunch of different ferromagnetic material. All right, just means we got iron in it, okay? Some sort of metal alloy that has uh, iron in it, okay? Ferrous, non-ferrous, those sort of things. All right, so if we wanna calculate the reluctance, all right, so that was, uh, you know, an example, we talked about that a couple slides ago, I gave you this equation. So reluctance is length divided by mu A. All right, so we wanna determine the reluctance of a material whose length is 3.5 centimeters, a cross-sectional area of 0.1 meters, if the absolute permeability is 120 times 10 to the minus seven. So with this one, units matter. That's really where your only hiccups are gonna be, else you just plug into the equation. That 3.5 centimeters has to be converted to meters. So you wanna use 0 0.035 centimeters. All right, so we're gonna take, that's the length, 0 0.035. And then this one, I kinda of set up how you should put it in the calculator. So if you put it in this way, you know, it should work out okay for you. So we have 0 0.035 divided by, you know, parentheses, 120 times 10 to the minus seventh, and then times the 0 0.01. So really we just had to do the conversion to the 3.5 centimeters to meters, substitute into our equation, okay? And so the reluctance of this material, remember reluctance, how it doesn't want to establish a magnetic field, is 2.9 times 10 to the fourth, all right? Uh, let's do, why don't you pause the video and try the next one on your own, and then we'll work through it. So it says determine the reluctance of a material with a length of 0.25 meters and cross-sectional area of 0.15 meters if the absolute permeability is 110 times 10 to the minus seven. So this example, we don't have to do any conversions. Everything is in meters. All right, so we can do direct substitution into the equation here. And when we do that and plug in, I don't know if I need to know, walk you through all the plug and chug sort of thing, but it's uh, 1.5 times 10 to the fifth and turns divided by Weber. So that's our our um, reluctance calculations that we need to do. So just a summary on magnetic field intensity, all right? There's two different ways we talked about this. Um, F sub N, remember that's the magnetomotive force, okay? So we wanna talk about the field intensity now, which is H, the hysteresis. The hysteresis is the magnetic field intensity. 
So we take the magnetomotive force, the F sub M, divide it by L, which is the length of the path. Or it, this equation means the same thing, because remember F sub N equals N times I, number of turns times current, first formula we learned in the lecture. All right. So these two formulas are the same thing. I'm just writing one on the left is you know, the magnetomotive force, or the one on the right, just writing it in terms of amp turns, both divided by L. So that's going to calculate our magnetic field intensity. All right. So that's the entire magnetic field. It's not just the lines of flux now. It's everything, you know, how strong is that magnetic field? So we know all these different units that we're going to apply here. All right. But we want to do right magnetic field intensity. What does it represent? It's the effort the given current has to put into establishing a flux density in a material. So how the strength of magnetic field, how much flux density that we're going to need, all right, or how strong that's going to be. So when we talked about that, it being at the north and south poles. All right, uh, this is one you can kind of maybe test at home sometime. If you have a strong enough magnet, all right, and you take a small wire and move it across it, you can actually kind of feel what goes on, all right. But if we were to move a wire across the magnetic field, all right, we would actually be able to establish a current when we do this. So you can move it across the field, and you'll, there'll be a small current move. Now, um, where does that come into play? So when we have something like a windmill, all right, or something that rotates, so what's on that windmill, all right? There's some brushes that capture the electron flow, but what does the wind do? The wind moves, all right, some sort of uh, propeller type thing. All right, and on the back of that are magnets. And then there's stationary magnets, that are aligned a certain way, and then there's magnets on the apparatus, the, the propeller, that the wind spins. All right, so what are we doing? So as the wind spins, those magnets pass each other, and those magnets all have wires around them. So what are you doing as the wind's spinning? Okay, the wind, the magnetic field is moving, enforcing electron flow in the wire. So that's how something like that is when we use wind power and things like that. It's called an induced voltage. All right, so we can induce the voltage by moving a magnet around wire and things like that. So this is going to be important when we get into motors here in a little bit too, when we start talking about DC motors. Okay, here's what Faraday talked about though. All right, so it's it's Faraday's law, but he generated a current. Okay, by moving a magnet through a coil of wire, he was able to do that. I'm going to try and come up with this in a lab for us to kind of detect it's. It's not the easiest thing uh, for us to do, having strong enough magnets to do this, okay? But we can actually create an induced voltage by pulling a magnet through a coil of wire. That magnetic field, okay, impacts the electron flow on current. Now we do have to have a closed path, so notice as this is shown across a voltmeter, we have a closed path on it. Uh, but cool experiments to do, right? Take a magnet, slide it through a coil of wire, and then you can watch as it goes through. So Lenz did something different, all right? Same kind of concept though. So what Lenz did is he used um, the magnet to induce current, okay? Through the coil changes. So the polarity, he was able to move the magnet one way or the other way and change the polarity or the motion uh, that that caused. So he could flip that around. So that's very, very important stuff using both of their laws when we start talking about uh, motors and things here in a few minutes. All right. So just as a moving magnetic field induces a voltage, current in a coil causes a field. All right. So that's really what we're doing. The magnet we can induce a voltage, or we can create a magnetic field. And this is the concept of what inductors are used for. We don't get into big inductor inductor stuff uh, in this course but an inductor is literally a coil of wire. So if you've ever opened up your, you know, your computer or your motherboard and you see these little coils of wire, that's really what they're doing. We're creating some sort of magnetic field so that we can do some sort of switching or things like that, or filtering uh, is another way that we can help filter and control the direction of stuff, all right? So for us, what we're gonna limit it to in this class, okay, we're gonna talk about what a DC generator is. Well, it's a generator, which means we are taking mechanical motion and creating electricity. So if we're generating, we're generating electricity, so we're, it's a transducer, we're gonna be taking mechanical motion and creating electricity. 
So when we talk about a DC generator, this is kind of the basics behind it. Notice there's two magnets here. There's a north and a south. Okay, and those are permanent magnets that sit on what we call the stator or the outside portion of the motor. And then we have the rotor. That's the mechanical shaft that's doing the turning. Okay, so based on the coils of wire and how the wire are on that shaft, that rotor piece, all right, we're inducing this to rotate based on magnetic fields. Okay, so as the coil rotates, Okay, we rotate the magnetic field and we generate a voltage pause. All right, so remember, so this is going back to the first law we learned, Faraday's law, right? What are we doing? We're, we're using a magnetic field, the north and south magnet, okay, to induce a voltage across the coils of wire here. And we're pulsing that voltage and that voltage is going to force that rotor to turn. Okay, and then we use the brushes to capture that okay and this works both ways this is how a generator a generator means we're we're doing something to crank it and then uh, the motor works the same way we're going to reverse the order and use the electricity to move it all right so uh, to make mechanical movement that's really just the difference between these two one thing you know need to know about DC motors DC motors have brushes okay and they connect to the commutator the commutator is that white circle in the middle that the brushes are touching all right, and I'll, I'll have a video of how this kind of works uh, in class as well on some motors that I have that are open and we can actually see how the brushes work and how the, uh, the commutator works and how all this stuff interfaces. Okay, so that's the commutator piece. So that's the interface between the rotor and the brushes. So as the rotor is rotating around, that commutator is rotating with it and the brushes rub up against uh, the commutator. Okay, and that's how we get the current flow all right to work in a dc generator and that goes out to our external circuit where you're charging a battery or doing something like that so that's a dc generator the motor works the exact opposite we send the current in through the brushes okay and the commutator gets excited and we rotate it that way and we make mechanical movement so same kind of concept so a dc generator for us a good example i can give you is like a a little handheld uh, weather radio that you have that has a crank on the back so when you take the crank out, you're literally cranking the battery, all right, or crank type start system, all right, and that cranks it up and charges the battery and gets it to work there. So you have kind of, you're the manual generator on that piece that's going to generate the electricity. All right, so different types. This is kind of the core of what the rotor looks like. So the rotor, if we go back, that's the internal piece here. You only, it only looks like one wire right here, but it's a lot more than just the one that you see. All right, that's just a breakaway so that you can see and understand. It actually goes around this core, all right? So we got this core, I'm sorry. It's a ferromagnetic core, okay? So we got a material here that has what? High permeability. We want to be able to conduct a magnetic field, okay? And we can produce a magnetic field. So here's what one looks like without all of the wires wrapped around it. And it does matter that we wrap those in certain directions, right? Because we want polarity. All right, and then the commutator sits on the shaft and the brushes touch the commutator. Here's what one looks like, okay, uh, that uh, uh, has all the wires on it and how they're wound, okay, and then there's a commutator where we can have the brushes that rub against this, okay. So essentially this is what it's looking like. The magnet's a lot bigger than this, all right, but we have the magnetic field that goes around the outside. We have the shaft that rotates. The rotor is wound, so as it rotates, all right, creates that induced voltage uh, because of the magnets on the outside. So the stator is considered the out. We have two parts. We have the stator, which is the outside kind of shell of the the rotor there uh, that has a field. In this case, it's the the magnets. Okay, and we have the rotor. That's the piece that's actually moving on the inside. All right. So DC motor, like I said, is the same thing. Uh, same build. Same build, the concept's just the opposite. So when, we, when we're generating, we're going mechanical to electrical. When we're, going, when we're doing a motor, we're going electrical to mechanical. So we're just reversing the order now. So now we put electricity uh, into the, uh, the commutator from the brushes, all right? So we hook that up to a source, and then that source changes the field using current now. Okay, current's gonna go through those wires, and as the current goes through those wires, Remember, they're wound in different directions. We're constantly changing the magnetic field. Constantly changing the magnetic field, 
forces this shaft to rotate because it bounces off and on to the north-south poles. All right, so this is where the opposites attract, likes repel. So we're trying to get it so they're constantly likes. So the north is hitting the north side, the south is hitting the south side as it rotates. And as it rotates, the direction of the wire changes because of how it's wound around the rotor. So as it rotates around, it'll be south on south on one side and it'll be north on north on the other side. So it'll constantly push it, all right? Because likes repel and that's how we generate that. If they were opposites, they would attract and the shaft would not move. It would just sit there. All right, because it would hold it in place. So we have to force it and wind the wire correctly so that we end up getting um, op, um, not opposites, uh, likes, so that they repel each other and it can rotate around. Very, very, very uh, important concept. And I'll try to make sure I have some videos of some different motors and, and recap this so that we can really talk about it and you can physically see. I know it's tough to tell from some of these, these drawings and things like that about how it actually interfaces. But we'll do some labs where we can kind of see the motor and it rotates around, okay? But essentially, okay, there's a little animation we got up here at the top, but what is it doing? As it rotates around, okay, and it's getting current from the commutator, we are forcing it so that it is likes when it goes by so that it pushes it and forces it constantly around, <clears throat> okay? Another type of motor we're gonna talk about is a brushless DC motor. Okay, so it doesn't have the commutator. Okay, it has a permanent magnet on the rotor. I have one of these, uh, I'll try to pass around in class. Okay, it's a little bit different. So the windings are on the stator portion on the outside and the permanent magnet is the rotor now. So we've kind of switched uh, what we talked about. So uh, that's really when we talk about a brushless DC motor, that's the difference between the DC motor and the brushless DC motor. We flipped where the magnets are. So a normal DC motor that requires brushes and a commutator, all right, the permanent magnets are on the outside part, the wiring is on the rotor. Now, with a brushless DC motor, the permanent magnet is the rotor, and on the outside is where the wiring piece is. Okay, so um, it, it revert, we can reverse the current, make it go different directions as well. All right, um, so the cause, uh, changing the current is what's gonna cause it to rotate now okay through the outside portion all right so let's talk about it you're going to do some labs with the motors uh as, as well so we got a brushless dc motor okay it's series wound so there's different advantages uh to when we have like a brushless dc motor and when it's in series and shunt and we'll get into that even more in mechanical and in motor controls okay but think of it as a series winding and a parallel winding that's really what it is so series and shunt shunt's just a fancier word for parallel but so what we have um, and why DC motors are good, right? Um, instantaneous torque. That's really what it is. Your starting torque is going to be very, very high for a DC series motor. So like, you know, your golf cart can beat your Ferrari off the line for like, you know, a quarter of a second or something like that because it has instantaneous torque. When you ride in a golf cart and it's, you know, it's a DC motor, you put it down, you're, you're going right away and you can be at full speed right away. Now your full speed isn't very fast. All right, but you're gonna have instantaneous torque. So very, very important. So a series wound motor, very high starting torque. Those can be dangerous though. Uh, they can run away if there's no load. You need to make sure there's a load on them else the torque will just kind of get out of hand and it'll destroy itself, okay? It'll run way too fast if there's no load to help slow it down. All right, so it's the most dangerous one is a, is a series motor, all right? You need to make sure you have a load on it. And you guys will do a lot of that in the mechanical class, okay? Uh, when you uh, when you build the different drives and things like that, okay? A shunt wound motor, okay? So shunt is in parallel. So notice if we look at the different, uh, where the field coil is versus the armature. Uh, just to review the armature, that's the rotor piece, okay? And the field coil, that's the stator piece on the motor. And we'll, I'll physically kind of show you those pieces uh, in class on the motors as well, okay? So we got a shunt wound DC motor. Okay, so shunt means we're doing it in parallel. And what happens here is our flux is constant because we are in parallel. That's really what it is. So for us, we use one of these more for speed control. All right, so we wanna use a series motor if we're talking more torque. We need a lot more torque, strength. All right, speed is not its asset. We can get some speed out of it, but not what we're looking for. If we want a shunt wound motor, okay, something in parallel, 
we can uh, control speed much better, all right? So torque tends to be constant in this case. So this is a constant torque variable speed type scenario here. So where would we use something like that? Think about a conveyor, right? As you put a load on and off of something, we want to make sure that that torque is the same. So like it's not impacted if we put a heavy load on a conveyor or something along those lines, okay? So let's just review some magnetic units that we've talked about here. A Tesla Weber, all right, so Tesla's magnetic flux density. Flux is a Weber permeability, right? How well it can establish a magnetic field. Reluctance, how it doesn't want to establish a magnetic field. Okay, magnetomotive force is the amp terms, right? Number of turns uh, times the current. And we have a magnetizing force, that's the hysterius, okay? That's the H amp term meter, okay? So we have beta, phi, mu, reluctance, all right, the R, magnetomotive force, M, and the H, the hysterius. Remember, hysterius is just the magnetomotive force is part of the equation divided by the L, the length, okay? So, key terms that you need to know on your test and everything, all right, they are in the, the back section, uh, chapter section of the book that you can go through, but I'll post them up here so you can pause the video and write them all down. They are on your test, and you will need to know all of these uh, as well. So that is it for chapter 7. I'm going to have some follow-up videos uh, showing you guys uh, the different motors, what they look like on the inside, and what we're really talking about here, how the fields work and impact the motor. Um, yeah, but I'll do that in kind of a separate video uh, for you guys to watch just to gain some understanding of what the insides are like. You know, Th This was a tougher uh, class for me when I had to take something like this because my instructor never had any example pieces for me. I'm calculating some flux and things like that on a motor, and I didn't even know what a motor looked like and all that uh, when I was going through school. So for you guys, uh, advantage being able to see the guts of a motor and uh, seeing how the magnetic field truly really is important and how it impacts everything. All right, but this is the end of Chapter 7. Uh, make sure you study for your lecture quiz. All right, and we'll have that, and make sure that you're doing your online assignment and your reading as long as with this as well. Remember your reading uh, as you go through punctuation matters, spelling matters, because it matches it character for character when it grades. Else, you have any questions, uh, go ahead and either email me or ask me in class.